Okay, this is going to be a voice recording for ecology. Um, we're going to start off, I'm going to try to put this into two sections because I think otherwise it's going to take too long. Um, first part we talked about way back at the beginning of the year was ecology. Uh, and the, the first component was population ecology. So, uh, I'm sorry, behavioral ecology. Uh, and when we looked at this, we looked at the different types of behaviors that are exhibited by species and um, how that governs into um, the grand scheme when we'll talk about populations and communities and things like that. Uh, so one of the first parts is understanding the difference between innate and learned. Uh, so remember innate is something that is inborn. Um, uh, this is something that is hardwired to the uh, organism's um, genes uh, and and is exhibited by all species, so this is all genetic based. Genetic based. It's kind of hard to write. And then learned behaviors are ones that we have to have some sort of exposure to the environment. We have to have some sort of experience in life for this one. Um, and behavioral ecology is going to look at all these different things. So one of the first things we're going to look at is innate behaviors uh, in this genetic component. So we're looking at, uh, for the first example here, uh, three-spined stickleback fish. Uh, and what you see in this species is the males have a red underside and the females do not. Um, so experiment was set up to test what is the thing that really triggers uh, the behavior of this fight because uh, it's a very territorial species. So scientists looked at um, the red pattern. Uh, they also looked at the shape. Uh, and they found out that the red pattern with the red on the underside and the white on the upper side is going to be the major thing that stimulates um, what is called this fixed action pattern, AP. And the sign stimulus is the actual red part underneath the white part. Uh, it doesn't have to do with the shape or anything like that. So they made mimics uh, very similar to uh, what you'd see in fish lures that looked almost identical to this species. Uh, but they excluded the red part of the fish, and they noticed that it didn't elicit any sort of behavior where uh, the male actually attacked that lure. But when they started taking lures that didn't even really look like the fish, but had the pattern, uh, they did attack. Uh, same thing with in the females. Since females don't have that red and white, uh, if it wasn't there and you still had the shape, the, the male did not attack that. So this would be an example of an innate behavior. We've got fixed action pattern, uh, sign stimulus. The big thing is if it starts, it goes to completion. Uh, there's no way for the organism to really overthink that, especially in the, the more basic types of organisms. There's not a huge amount of cognitive component in their, in their nature. Uh, the next part is looking at taxis versus kinesis. Um, when you're talking about the taxis component, we're, we're talking about change in orientation uh, because of some sort of stimulus. So right here we're doing rodeo taxis. We're talking about uh, the orientation to the stream or water movement. Uh, and then we've got different types of taxis that we've seen throughout the year, uh, like chemotaxis or phototaxic. Um, when we look at plants, they are positive phototaxic, meaning that they lean towards the light. Well, light is their food source, whereas their um, roots are positive geotaxic, so they're moving towards the earth, where the roots would be negative phototaxic. Um, the difference between taxis and kinesis, kinesis is all about the rate. Right? So this is about changing the rate. Right? So we're doing sort of some sort of behavior. Uh, and we're going to change it because of some sort of stimulus change. So example here is that in kinesis, sorry, kinesis, we're seeing uh, a change in the rate. So the sow bug or pill bug, which is part of the review here, um, arthropods, uh, they are they're actually closely related to the crustacea class. Um, they end up having a change in their rate of behavior because they're not in an environment that they want. So here they're in a dry, open environment. They prefer a moist environment because that's going to allow them to breathe better. Moving on. 
Um, another component of innate with a little bit of learning is the, uh, the idea of imprinting. Right? So we have this critical window that we're going to be looking at or critical period uh, in which this imprinting happens. So we're talking about some sort of behavior that is learned, uh, but it is innate component. So you really don't, the organism really doesn't have to, to think about learning it. Um, it's more built into the organism. But there's this critical period, this critical window that this imprinting can happen. So example here, uh, this gentleman, scientist, uh, that first started looking at a lot of this different types of imprinting behavior, uh, Carl Vaughn, uh, and he, he, what he did was he did a lot of experiments with goslings and uh, looked at how if he took the goslings from the mother when they were first born and started doing a lot of behaviors to take care of them, they started imprinting on his face and his behaviors and learned that this is in fact their mother. And so in turn treated them, treated him like their mother. Uh, and you ended up getting that, that critical period of those first couple of months uh, where they learn who is the mother and who is the one that's going to take care of them. And in turn, he, he got that. Uh, bird song is also an example of one of these critical period imprinting ideas. Uh, another one would be, uh, or an example of this where we, we see the difference is uh, the cuckoo bird. I think I spelled cuckoo wrong. Um, but the cuckoo bird has what's called brood parasitism. And in brood parasitism, the baby uh, is laid, or the egg is laid in another species' nest. Uh, so the baby grows with the mother being a different species. So in turn, the cuckoo bird really never learns the song of its species. And so in turn, it, it ends up doing a, a mixed grab bag of different types of calls, but it never does really one for its own species. Continue on here. Into next part. Uh, and we're starting to learn about associative learning or learned behavior uh, where we're assigning uh, a, a pattern of learning to some sort of stimulus that's around them. So this is more of a non-programmed part. You actually have to go through the experience in order to develop this. So we have um, the first one here, which is operant conditioning. Okay, so this is operant for trial and error, where the organism has to experience some sort of uh, stimulus in the environment and in turn will associate something to that stimulus. So an example here is the blue jay eating a viceroy or a monarch butterfly. And if you know anything about the monarch butterfly or the viceroy, the caterpillars eat uh, a milkweed plant in its uh, larval state. And the tissues get saturated with these milkweed poisons. And it carries over through chrysalis and into adult form and so the monarch and the viscera have these very unpalatable um, chemicals that are saturated in their tissues, even into the adult form. So a blue jay eats a monarch, it gets a very bad experience. And here you see the, the blue jay is throwing that up. Uh, and in turn, when it was born, it really never knew uh, in its genes that this pattern is something to avoid. Uh, but after it does it once, it learns to avoid this pattern and in turn the, the monarch and viscerous species end up surviving better because of the color pattern that they exhibit. So this would be an example of operant uh, learning or trial and error. The other one is classical conditioning. Right? In classical conditioning, we're still doing some sort of pattern of learning because of an experience, uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to have some sort of um, insignificant stimulus that is going to be tagged to it. So the example is Pavlov's dogs. Pavlov uh, set up a food, and it, and, you know, food elicits the salivary glands to start producing saliva, salivary amylase, and allow a digestion to begin. But if you start putting things in addition to that, uh, what we find is the organism starts actually exhibiting behaviors in addition to not only the significant stimulus but also insignificant stimulus. So what we end up having is the food and this insignificant stimulus, so whether it be a tuning fork or a bell, um, will actually start the 
of a behavior of salivating. So present the food, salivation. Present the food and a bell, and all of a sudden, the organism starts associating the bell with the food production. So you keep doing this over and over and over, and then even if you just give the bell, the organism expects the food to be coming next, and in turn starts salivating. So this would be classical conditioning. Um, in addition to this, uh, we also see what's called habituation, which is the loss of um, significant behavior because of uh, over stimulation with lack of returns. So this would be the boy crawling, cry, crying wolf syndrome. Um, maybe the first time somebody said, oh, no, there's a wolf in the room. You'd freak out, right? And your heart would start racing, and you'd get that adrenaline kick from the adrenal glands. Um, and you get that fight or flight response. Um, but then you realize that there's no wolf there. You calm down. Things are good. The next day, the student comes into class. Oh, there's a wolf in here. Maybe once again, you get tricked. And you think, oh my gosh, there's a wolf in here. I better run out of here. Um, and that, that adrenal gland kicks in. You start producing epinephrine. You start going into that fight or flight. And then you realize there's no wolf there. Maybe upon the third or fourth time, the person calls, there's a wolf in here. Well, now you've lost that, that idea that this is something significant, and in turn, you wouldn't have that response. So that's an example of habituation. All right. Continue on here. We're going to get into population ecology. Uh, population, remember, population is about all one type of species in a given area. One species in a given area. Uh, so to connect this out to evolution, uh, evolution, we're talking about population evolving, not one individual evolving, right? Evolution is all about a population that is undergoing change. Uh, one species, given area, over a period of time. Um, so what things type, what types of things change population? We're going to have increase in number because of birth rate. Uh, we're going to have an increase in number because of immigration. Uh, things that would change it going down would be, uh, example would be if there is death or if there is organisms leaving. Um, that would that would cause it, uh, a decrease in its lungs. Um, disease, predation, right, all those things are going to play a part in decreasing the population size of its lungs. Uh, big things that go with this, biotic and abiotic. Uh, bio means life. So these are all the things that are in and around a population that are living. Uh, so even though we might be talking about the sparrow population, uh, other biotic things that might live in its environment or its community might be the trees, the plants, maybe the wolves, all those other things that live in the environment that they're living in. And then the abiotic, the non-living things, so this would be like the sunlight, the water, the soil composition, all those types of things would be the abiotic factors. All right, so with that, uh, different populations exhibit different types of growth patterns and survival patterns. Uh, one of the types of patterns is a type 1 pattern, and what you see is uh, a lot of the organisms will survive for an extended period of time, right? So we have death rate or maximum uh, organisms that make the maximum lifespan. Uh, a majority of the organisms will make it out to about 75% um, of the population make it out to the maximum lifespan, right? and then you end up getting past that. We, we start seeing a die-off. So maybe the maximum lifespan is 100, which is not in humans. Um, and in turn, we see that most people right, will make it out to uh, about 75 years old. Well, a hydra, which is a cnidaria, is not maximum lifespan of 100 years. So in turn, we're, we're talking about a great system, same thing with an oyster. So this might only be maybe two, three years. Oyster might only be two, three years. So we're talking about a, a big difference as far as what the maximum lifespan is. But the idea is the curves here. So we're seeing a majority of the organisms are making it through the young ages and all the way out to the old ages. But once they get out to the old age, there's a severe decline or death rate. Whereas the hydra, we're going to see continual death all along uh, the, the maximum lifespan of the species. And then the oyster, kind of like a boom or bust type of thing, where we're going to have a lot of babies die right off the get-go. But if you make it within those first couple years, or those first couple months, it's probably pretty good that you're going to make it out to your maximum expectancy. So these are the different types of survivorship curves. we got type 1, type 2, and type 3. We're going to connect these to, uh, for example, case-selected populations. 
understand our selected populations. And we'll talk about those in a little bit. We're going to take a little pause here. We'll catch up with the second part uh, with the next 15 minutes.